Right, hello, and um, welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined from all the way across the world in the UK, in the Midlands, by Jude Jennison. How are you doing, Jude? I'm very good, thank you, John. Yeah, and so um, Jude uh, you know, works with, uh, she has a, a book called Leading Through Uncertainty. Um, she works with teams and businesses, uh, you know, to help with leadership and team development. But she also does a very interesting thing, and that is working on, on leadership and confidence skills using horses. Uh, and so this is, this is rather fascinating as I, as I um, read this, Jude. Um, first of all, your relationship with horses over the years, because people would assume, oh, well, you obviously grew up around horses and, you know, were riding horses forever. But that's not the case, right? Uh, it's not the case. No, I used to be frightened of horses and it was in the process of uh, overcoming my fear of them that I learned about this way of working with them. So prior to that, I had a had a lengthy corporate career doing a whole range of leadership roles. So horses are are were alien to me as a as a species but I've got to know them and love them and they're just fabulous to work with. So what is it about horses that uh, in particular that are able to teach us about leadership and self-confidence? Well they're they're hugely sensitive animals and they respond based on your non-verbal communication and behavior and there's a tendency to think that we use our words to influence and yet it's our non-verbal, it's, our, it's what we're thinking, what we're feeling about other people, what your intentions are, your energy, your emotions, all of that that we're rumbling internally and we think we're hiding it really well, but it's e oozing out of us. And of course, you know that because you only need to walk into a meeting room where there's been an argument and we sense it and feel it, but we often don't then speak to it, but we, we feel it, we just tend to ignore it. What horses do is they respond based on all of that and it's a chance for us to be really curious about where am I brilliant non-verbally and where am I derailing my relationships, my team, my career. Yeah, so uh, so when, when somebody is uh, working with a horse maybe for the first time, what are some of the non-verbal um, cues that a horse picks up that uh, that that leads you to you know that you can extrapolate okay here's some issues maybe the person needs to deal with or some things that they need to work on um things like well horse, horses want what people want so they want clarity of direction are you clear about what you're asking them to do they want a strong relationship based on trust and mutual respect and they want the freedom to choose whether they come or not and those are three things that need to be in balance so if you spend too much time focusing on the results and not enough relationship, they disengage. If you spend lots of time building a lovely relationship, stroking the horse, but you fail to provide them with a direction, then they'll refuse to move. And people are more polite. So people will go with you when, that, when your leadership is not quite on point, whereas horses won't. So some of the things that get uncovered are uh, self-doubt, a lack of self-belief, self-confidence, um, self-awareness, the assumptions that we're making, the emotions that we have. So we've all felt frustration in the workplace. And usually we feel frustrated with somebody who doesn't do what we want them to do. Well, if you feel frustrated with a horse, they'll just disengage and refuse to engage. So it's a chance to be much more mindful about what are the emotions that I'm having and how do I use those as a source of information? So for example, if I feel frustrated, there's something that I'm wanting from that relationship or that person that I'm not getting. So to be really curious about what is it I want and to provide clarity and direction around that and be honest about what we're thinking and what we're feeling. So a lot of it is about transparency and authenticity. Yeah, and that, that's, that, that's fascinating too because uh, I'm just writing down here is, that that idea of uh, yeah we get frustrated uh, at, at people uh, because they're not doing things that maybe we want them to do or they're not doing it in the way that we think they should 
but if when we do have a not that honest conversation, it often often comes across, as you said, the reason is because we never provided real clarity. We made assumptions. We assumed they knew what we were talking about. We assumed that maybe they had the experience to do. We make a ton of assumptions mm-hmm. without ever validating them. Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, my my latest book is called Opus, The Hidden Dynamics of Team Performance. And in there, I talk about 12 hidden dynamics that are occurring in every team. And one of those is the assumptions that we make. So we make assumptions about whether people will engage or disengage. We make assumptions about whether we like them or not and whether they like us or not. And if we make the assumption that there is going to be conflict, we're more likely to create it by our nonverbal behavior because we go in either on the offensive or on the defensive. Yeah, and that's and that's fa- and that's fascinating. Uh, also, about the, the self awareness piece because that is for me that is the hardest part, and the thing that I think holds most people back from fulfilling their potential is is self awareness. And achieving a level of self awareness is not a particularly easy thing because it does require you like looking at yourself. So, um, when when people work with the with the horses, um, how does that help with the self awareness piece? Well, I think it lightens it a bit because I think, as you as you allude to, self awareness can sometimes be a bit awkward and and icky because sometimes we don't like what we see when we look at our behaviour, and mm-hmm. so we what we like to do is pretend that we're doing things perfectly because we actually don't like to fail. Whereas when you're working with a horse, if the horse refuses to move, that's feedback. That's feedback on your leadership and team skills. And it's very clean and it's very clear and it's non-judgmental and there's no agenda with it. But it's a, it's a chance to be curious and say, OK, not that. So what is it the horse is wanting? And therefore, my job is to then help them map that back to the workplace and say, well, if the horse is wanting you to be more confident, how do you demonstrate more confidence in the workplace? Or if the horse is wanting you to trust them and not be micromanaged, how does that relate to how you might lead a team in the workplace? Yeah, and and I think and I think part of what you were just saying earlier is uh, is is fascinating as well because sometimes we do focus in too heavily on one aspect or another. As you said, maybe we focus in too much on the relationship aspect, uh, but don't provide clarity or expectations around outcomes, or we focus far too much on that and on the relationship. So that 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 whole balance is is I mean that's 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 quite a challenge to uh, to achieve it's really tricky and I always say it's like a knife edge of us being on our leadership and we're, and we're either too relational or too focused on the results and we're constantly flipping between the two and and when you absolutely get it bang on you know because it it feels effortless when you're leading a team or a or a person whether it's a whether it's a client or a supplier whatever the relationship is when it's in flow, it's effortless and it's easy. When it's slightly awkward and clunky, I always say that's the chance to explore of where am I? Am I being too focused on the result or too much on the relationship? And how do I bring that back into balance? And we're really talking about fine tuning here. Mm-hmm. And and what I loved it, because I, I was saying before we came on air, I watched uh, the video from from one of the people that you helped. And it was it was very interesting, the fact that after working with the horses, that uh, she felt more confident in speaking to high level executives like you know, C-level, um, high uh, executive level. And and I know from my own limited experience of riding horses, I mean, you do go in initially when you approach the horse, you think, Oh my goodness, this thing is huge. Uh, and 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 a lot of your confidence drains out. And I think that happens with a lot of people. And you know, when you go, well, I've no experience, what's going to happen? And I, I think there's a lot of people do that when they interact with people who they perceive to be on a higher level than them, them, especially in sales. A lot of the confidence drains out of them and they take and they present themselves in maybe a, a somewhat subservient role. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think particularly when you're working with uh, people where you perceive them to have more power over you and and in reality, they they don't. But often when people are managing their boss or the MD or CEO of a company or, as you say, in a sales conversation, then often people will give their power away. So they'll just diminish themselves 
And of course, if you do that with a horse, they'll flatly refuse to engage with you. So you have to match them in that level of power and energy without getting into a power struggle. And therein also lies a, a, a tricky point of leadership of how do you raise your energy and your confidence level without being overconfident and therefore being too dominant? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's such a that, that's such a challenging balancing act uh, because uh, sometimes, as, as as you would well know, sometimes I think when you become aware of things, then you start to overcompensate. So maybe you go from, and that's why we have, and that's why we have in society, we have pendulum swinging from one extreme to the other. So I, I guess that's part of it too, is that you have to learn the appropriate level of all of these components. Absolutely. And if you think about from a, a sales point of view, nobody likes a salesperson that bounces in full of their own importance and full of like over self-confident. Nobody, everybody gets switched off by that. But equally, if a salesperson comes in and is not confident about what they're selling, then the client's not going to engage and they're not going to buy into it. So we're, we're trying to find that knife edge yeah. of like being really honest and being really open and really authentic and showing up and saying, here I am, here's what I do. What do you want? What do you need? And are we a good fit? And if we're not a good fit, that's OK, too. And to have the humility to be able to go away and say, no, that's okay. We're not a good fit. Yeah, yeah, that, that, and it goes back to what you uh, mentioned earlier about the authenticity piece. Because I mean, if you're authentic and you really want to help people, uh, that's what sales is about. It's about helping people. And if your solution or your service isn't going to help that person, isn't going to do what they need, then that's great. Great for you to know, and it's great for them to know. And again, you're doing them a service, and that might actually get you. Who knows? Might get you a referral in the future. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what you said, okay, so if I approach a horse from a very, uh, with, with total lacking in confidence and going, oh my goodness, this thing is huge. You said, okay, the horse will probably do nothing, won't engage with you. Um, if you approach a horse, uh, as we were just saying, if you're overcompensating and you come in way too confident and too domineering, how does the horse react? It depends on the horse <laughs> and it depends on, and it depends on what the person actually needs, believe it or not. So, um, it's not uncommon for people to come in overconfident because that tends to be how we compensate for mm -hmm. a lack of confidence some, <laughs> sometimes. And for those people who do overcompensate, if they work with my mare, for example, which is a female horse, um, and all my work is done on the ground, by the way, so it's, it's, there's, there's no riding involved. If they go up to her and they pretend to be super confident, but inside they're not, and they say, right, come on, we're going, she will either refuse to, em to engage and close her eyes and fall asleep and shut them out. Or if she thinks they need putting in their place, she will headbutt them gently. And often then what happens is if that person then engages in a, in a power struggle and nudges her back, you then get this power struggle where they nudge her and she nudges them. And and that can be very uncomfortable to watch, watching somebody leading a horse with this constant power struggle. By the way, it can be very uncomfortable to be in that kind of a power struggle in the workplace as well. Yeah. So, and, and there's something very compelling about when a horse puts you in your place, you know that it, there's no judgment, you know there's no agenda, and they've not, they've not come with a preconceived idea. And usually the person that is being headbutted by, ma by mayor as usually watch somebody else lead her confidently and quietly without getting into a power struggle. So it's, it's a real eye opener for people to look and say, okay, how do, how do I do this differently so that I get a better, a better result, a better relationship yeah, and, and, I, I, in a way that's, that has both of us being in harmony. That's kinder for both of us. And, and what, what, what I love about what you just said is that idea of, you know, the horse doesn't come to the engagement with any preconceived notions. They don't know who you are. They don't know what your experience level is or whatever. And I think that uh, that sometimes we approach, and it, go back to sales, sometimes we approach these engagements with high level people and we project onto them what we think they will think about us. But, but generally speaking, especially if you're meeting for the first time, they're pretty much coming with no preconceived notions or ideas about you. Exactly. But, but what 
what will quickly happen with people is we very quickly make a judgment. So we mm -hmm. instantly make a decision about whether we like that person or not, or whether we trust them or whether they're credible. And all of that is nonverbal. So the moment you walk into a room or enter a Zoom call, as we do these days, the, the moment you engage with somebody for the first time, they instantly make a decision about you. Uh, and by the way, the horse will as well. And we're doing that non-verbally and we're, we're doing that based on our energy and what we're feeling and what we're sensing. We're just not as aware of it. And so working with the horses actually highlights that for people is to recognize that the instant you build a rapport, you're having an impact and to be curious about is it a positive one and is it the impact you want to have because if it's not then we would obviously want to fine tune it and do something different yeah and it's interesting what you just said about uh, zoom and that because obviously a lot of people have been uh, working virtually and will continue to do so and in sales they'll con you know there'll, there'll be people who continue to sell virtually and i think a lot of people struggle particularly at the beginning of the pandemic uh even if they're very good in front of people or walking into rooms and all of that is trying to do that through zoom and I think some people have made assumptions that nonverbal communication doesn't matter when you're in a, a virtual environment. Yeah, and I think in some ways it matters more. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because one of the things I'm very aware of is that on a, on, a, on a Zoom call, I tend to be more static because when people meet me face to face, I tend to be a bit like my move my arms around. But of course, if I did that all the time, on a zoom call and flailed my arms around it's really distracting but and it'd be so, memorable though it would be memorable <laughs> <laughs> but i've i've had to moderate my movements and and still find a, a way of being authentic with my movements so that i don't then become too rigid because what i was finding in the first couple of months of zoom calls was i sat so still that i went too far it's the pendulum swing again yeah. i went too far the other way and then, and then I was getting back and neck pain and I was wondering why. And it's because I was holding myself rigidly still because I didn't want to flail my arms around the way I would do normally in, in real life. So there's, there's this really delicate balance. And I think we're always continually trying to find that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's been a learning curve uh, for a lot of people. I also think there's, there's certain things that you can do. It's, uh, if you're sitting in a room in front of somebody and you say something and I look down and I start writing, you can see that. But on the Zoom call, you can't see that. So that's why I always think sometimes it's good to just call out what you're doing so that the person knows that you're still engaged saying, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just taking some notes here. Mm -hmm. So they don't think that you're looking at uh, the football results on your phone or something. <laughs> Um, so what is um, when when people finish uh, finish the, the the workshop or the engagement with the horses? Um, what are some of the things that really surprise them? Um, I think they they're often surprised at how the horses pick up on those tiny subtle nuances of nonverbal. So the fact that if somebody's thinking one thing and exhibiting their behavior in a different way the horses will know it the fact that the horses will feel if you're if a parent died last week and you're still feeling that grief and you're stuffing it down because you're trying to get on with work the horses will feel it um, the horses will know when you've had an operation on your knee for example so they're so sensitive to energy and and what we're thinking and feeling and I think that surprises people and I think what then surprises people more is to realize that as human beings, we're also sensing and feeling that. Um, and, and yet we're often not paying attention to it. And if we pay attention to it more, then we can start to influence in a better way. So for example, in a sales conversation, you know when a client is switched off. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have to have looked down and be looking at the football resorts to know that there's just something you feel it in your body. You might feel a slight dissonance of some sort. And that's information to say there's something that's slightly off. What is it that they're wanting that they're not getting from you? Is it more clarity? Is it more trust? Is it credibility? And to start really using that where we get that dissonance to start to use that and be curious about what is the nonverbal information trying to tell us and to ask better questions as a result of that. 
And I think that one of the one of the things that people do then is they really hone that skill of sensing energetically what's going on in the space and knowing when we need to change things. Yeah, and and I think that's that's critically important. Obviously, knowing that about yourself, but also as you said, I mean the horses pick it up from the other person. So I think it's also imp important, isn't it, that you learn to read other people or be sensitive to other because sometimes let's face it we appropriate everything so if you if you walk into a room and the person you meet and they seem kind of standoffish or there's something we immediately assume it's ourselves uh, and then then we get into a kind of defensive mode or panic mode or whatever it is but it may may have nothing to do with us at all uh, well and, and, and conversely we often yeah. hear people say oh that person's really aloof or really standoffish yeah. And often they're shy, they're introverted, yep. um, they're not, they're avoiding eye contact because they're, they're, there's a lack of confidence there. It's not that they they think they're better than you. It's it may be that they're introverted and they don't know how to engage. So I think there's all those assumptions that we make. I think the important thing is to learn to pay attention to where there's that dissonance in the relationship. And then be curious about what is needed without jumping to huge conclusions about the fact that we think that person doesn't like us or or, or whatever assumptions we're making. Yeah, we're, we're fantastic as humans, aren't we? We're fantastic as going to the most extreme interpretation of things immediately. Yeah, so somebody goes, oh, well, they just don't like me. And you think yeah, or conversely. Yeah. Or conversely, in sales, the, the, the overconfidence is we assume that everybody wants to buy what we've got to sell <laughs> and that we've got the best product or service ever and that everybody wants and needs it. And, and that's not true either. So it, it is about really engaging on, the, on its purest form with a here I am, here's what I can offer. Who are you and what, and what do you need and are we a good fit? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and listen to you, this has been f absolutely fascinating. To be honest, I was really looking forward to this interview because it, it is fascinating that the work you're doing and how much we have to learn from from horses about ourselves and, and just in general, how you can apply it to the world. And if you stop, if uh, self-awareness is a great thing, you know, self-indulgence, not so much. So you have to obviously, uh, you know, differentiate between the two, but being, being more aware of the cues you're getting from other people and the cues you're giving out yourself. I, I think that's fascinating. Uh, all of Jude's information is going to be below this video and all the links, et cetera. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and the work you do. Um, so I run a business called Leaders by Nature. You can find me on my website, judejennison.com. And um, the work, as we've talked about, is with, with horses to help leaders and teams understand their nonverbal behaviour, and particularly at times of disruptive change. And I think we've seen in the last 18 months where, through the pandemic, where we've experienced huge disruptive change and how challenging that is. And some people will embrace it readily and other people will resist it vehemently. And so what I, I do is I help people navigate that change in a, in a way that makes it easier for them individually and collectively as a team. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I would really, really encourage you to check it out. And I would, and even if you're not in the UK, just check out the the, the website, check out the videos, because it's fascinating, uh, fascinating stuff. And uh, and Jude obviously provides a lot of other services as well. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all again soon. Thank you. Yeah.